Well, thank you for joining us and welcome to everybody. Um, my name is Graham Miller. I work for the Innovation Super Network and I've been asked to sort of um, come along and run this session uh, for you guys this morning, along with my colleague Christine from the Academic Health Science Network. So um, I guess it's worth mentioning if you want to see the presentation on a slightly larger screen, if you double click on the presentation itself for those who haven't already done so, you'll see the presentation on a slightly larger format. So, um, as I've said, myself, Gray Miller, I work for the Innovation Super Network um, in, as, a, as an innovation manager, um, which means I work with small businesses to help develop innovations um, and, and sort of help businesses to kind of work through innovation problems. I also wear another couple of hats. I work on um, a project called the GX Project, which is what seems a very long time ago now. It's Legacy of the Great Exhibition of the North, again, encouraging businesses to innovate um, in the Northeast. And my final hat that I wear is um, the one that's kind of most appropriate to today, and that's the Vertical Labs side of things. So that is a Vertical Labs is a cluster of AR, VR, XR businesses um, working to kind of I guess I made a good in the northeast for all things. Um, joining us today, we have um, Rachel Burdis, who is an investment manager for the Invest North Eng Northeast England team. We have Russ Watts and Kristen Jordan from the Academic Health Science Network, uh, Matt Atkinson from Radical Panda, and Sean Allen from Vector76. We'll hear more from these guys in a minute. Um, so Rachel is going to give us an overview of the regional picture um, in relation to sort of the XR activities, the access and the facilities. Uh, Russ is coming at this from um, a using XR in, in an actual clinical setting point of view. Matt is going to tell us about um, revolutionizing those processes. So that was, um, I guess, being the solution provider working with Russ as the client. Uh, we're going to get that side. And Sean's going to give us further examples of um, XR tech and, and uses. We'll then move into um, Q and A's, and and I'll give a little summary and move into the session. Um, so, um, just to give you a flavour of why we're doing this, um, give um, everybody an overview of some of the XR activity that's going on in the region. There's lots of it, and we're only giving you a, a, a smattering of that today. Um, in a particular second, mainly. Um, we hope to be able to demonstrate some of the possibilities of the tech as it stands today and, and kind of what's coming at us. Um, and hopefully we'll enthuse um, some of you to engage in XR projects to your business or, or get involved in something yourself on that side. Um, the questions, because we're kind of very limited to time, we're not going to do questions at the end of each presentation. Um, I'd rather just kind of uh, approach them at the end of the session. So in the meantime, if something does come up, please use that as a chat function that you guys can use to ask a question and we'll collate them at the end of the session itself. I shall, with that, hand over to Rachel. You there, Rachel? She's on mute, I think. Yeah, okay. Sorry, that took me a while there. I couldn't hear, nor could I speak. So, yeah, I'm doing really well for this morning. Great stuff. Never mind. Um, yes, <laughs> thanks very much. Um, I'm going to do a, a kind of brief overview of um, the Northeast assets purely because this is an online event and um, there may be people who aren't from the region, and I want to just kind of give a quick overview of strength of the assets that are here um, and what's going on and the innovators and disruptors but for people who are in the region as well I've kind of got two asks for you one as Graham said the purpose of today is to see if there's anything that you can get involved in we've got great companies on your doorstep we've got support network organizations who can connect you in and now's a good time to look at whether types of applications can be used to help your business or upskill your um, staff, or educate your big line of talent. So it's good to know about who's here and thinking about that, as well as, you know, we want you to be our um, kind of influencers. We want you to talk about the region and the Northeast um, to people who aren't aware of it. You know, I've said it before, rise and tide with all ships, and let's be proud of what we've achieved here in the region. Yes, there are challenges, but certainly, you know, where you have got real strengths, then you have to make the most of them and, and let people know that they're here. 
So in terms of um, versus tech, I think you can see from the slides there um, that it's the second largest market. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why we have a, a unique um, kind of selling point for immersive tech, academic expertise, pipelines of uh, talent coming out of specialised courses, um, of people, key businesses who are working on um, XR applications every day and here now, um, as well as dedicated facilities. So of course, you're aware of Proto, but I'm going to tell you a bit more about what's going to be coming up projects and hubwise in the future. So really, it's to make you aware of, of what's happening so that you can get involved or you can talk about it uh, when you're kind of digging outside of the region. On the bottom there, you'll see the uh, high potential opportunity. That, now, that's something that we're working with international trade on. And effectively, it's been recognised that there's a real um, kind of opportunity here to work with our advanced manufacturing businesses, of which you know we have a, a rich heritage and we have a really strong cluster of, um, to support them in using um, XR applications, be it to reduce costs, to streamline processes, uh, to train up staff in a, a very safe way, and maybe in light of thinking about how you could use virtual worlds to attach is around avatars to ensure that social distancing is, is being put in place and staff are obviously safe whilst they're working. So there's a, a range of applications there and that's something that we're going to be promoting and saying come to this region and work with us and manufacturers here to those types of applications. Moving on to the next slide if you could please. Um, as I mentioned we've got centres of excellence of course we Hopefully we'll know already about Proto. Uh, Alex Cook is here today. I've used his image quite a few times <laughs> over the past few months, but if you want to have a chat to him about Proto, then free. But of course, we've got more than that going on. The Felix is one of two science parks in the Northeast. Uh, and with you know, the likes of Open Lab looking at various applications of immersive social innovation, it, it's not just about commercial applications, of course, it's also about benefiting the communities, helping people, perhaps even age better, as Nick mentioned, about how to ensure that people are ageing healthier and happier along the life. There's also future developments worth mentioning um, around incubation hubs that should hopefully be uh, early next year. Again, that's about supporting the startups and helping people to know who to speak to, when and where, you know, accessing peers, uh, transferring knowledge and sharing information, being in and around the businesses and having access to that as well. And that will form part of that under, um, theme, which Gabe said are looking at doing that National Innovation Centre for Immersive Technologies. Which I don't think the name's quite set, but I uh, yeah, ask Alex about that one. And again, that's to solidify our presence, at least having that real strength and again, combining those uh, expertise and skills and knowledge in place in an area. Then finally, just on the left side there, um, Talent skills, so we may not be aware that there are specialised courses in the northeast. Um, examples I've just put down, obviously, that Gator College recently started an emerging tech course, and we had a number of students um, from that course when I was working at Prodo come over and access the kit in order to kind of digitalise themselves and turn themselves into a zombie apocalypse or whatever it may be. But it's just being able to have the student access that kit to be able to create that content obviously helps them in time for when they're coming out to the industry. The same with the master's course that will be coming out at Northumbria University, which you may not have been aware of. I believe Charlie from Northumbria University is uh, at the Animal Conference virtually today. So again, anyone can have a chat with her around working with the university about potential um, research groups in immersive tech, PhD students, KTPs. And then, of course, Newcastle University covering games engineering. A lot of their students have gone to high profile uh, focusing on games but also immersive and I haven't covered up but I should have Teesside Uni of course it's got a brilliant reputation and again has access to kit for their students to be upskilled and work on creative projects and then one thing which um, Dynamo we working on um, before again I moved across to invest northeast was an idea of a digital creative club I think that's still around again have a chat with you um, if you're interested um, the idea would be freelancers, students to work on company projects. So if there are companies out there, you don't have time to do the R&D because naturally things have changed. And um, because of COVID, there may be something that uh, they can help with. It. So it's worth having a look at. But yeah, that's all for me. And I just want to kind of give a bit of an overview. And hopefully you've got something, if nothing at all, at least you've seen me this morning, managed to uh, unmute myself for about 10 minutes.
<laughs> Great. Thanks, Rachel. Really appreciate that. And it's really nice to get that overview of what's going on in the region and what's coming at us. So hugely appreciate your time on that one. Thanks for joining us. Um, if anyone has questions, like I said for Rachel, please just put them in the, the questions box. Unfortunately, I can't see that as a, as a presenter, so I'm not sure if they come in or not at this stage. Pop them in there and we'll um, address those uh, later in the session. If I can now hand over to Russ to talk to us about the XR in healthcare. Uh, thanks, Graham. Um, uh, for those who, who don't know me, I'm Russ Watkins. I'm the commercial director of the Academic Health Science Network. I'll briefly tell you what that is if, for those who don't know what it is, um, and then I'll talk specifically about some of the work we've been doing in in identifying um, some of the challenges within um, healthcare and where we've used or positioned um, XR to, to support um, support those solutions to those challenges. Can you do the next slide, Graham? Sure. Um, for those who um, don't know about the Academic Health Science Network, we um, the North East and North Cumbria is one um, of 15, um, and they were established in 2013 um, to drive forward um, largely the gap that kind of sits between um, academia, industry and, and the NHS. Um, particularly, we are funded um, from NHS England and NHS Improvement and the Office of Life Science. The Office of Life Science Commission um, is only um, just over a year old um, uh, and that's where we've taken some of the developments um, certainly around XR under the back of, of the Office of Life Science contract. Crit critically what that to do four things. One is it, it, it looks to be able to take the unmet need challenges from the NHS um, and, and position that uh, with industry far better than I think we have done in the past. Um, I think industry struggled to understand what some of the unmet need challenges are in the NHS. Um, so we um, aim to um, highlight those in a very particular challenge sort of environment. Um, we do a lot of signposting, um, certainly for innovators, in particular industry, into the NHS to understand what the NHS is and isn't, what some constraints are. Um, but also to take you on a development pathway from, you know, either idea through to through to adoption and spread. Um, we do work um, in the last sort of six to nine months around that that proposition and and what is real world validation. So you can have a bit of kit that works, but how does it actually work in the NHS environment? That's what we're really critical to understand. Is what's the added value? If it doesn't add any value, you won't. It won't get bought. It won't get only bought at scale. Um, so we do spend quite a lot of time and effort with industry in particular, understanding that real world um, validation proposition. And um, we do not. We're not sales force for anybody, um, but we do support um, across the fifteen um, around adoption and spread. Um, so if you've got a great product that's got a really good um, output from a real world validation perspective, then um, uh, we um, are able to um, spread that across the other um, 14 um, organizations. And we just go to the next slide. This, that's just a graphic um, to increase that. Um, one of the things that we created this year with, um, uh, in, in the last year was something called Health Network North. And this was a very deliberate um, brand, I guess, of the AHSN um, and the work that we do to, to bring that industry and NHS side of things together. Um, I, I'm sorry for the acronyms. Um, for those who don't know, the NHS um, ICS is Integrated Care Systems. That is the process in which the, the region comes together to look at the priorities of, of the NHS. So we work with both the um, ICS um, and the clinical network. So there are clinical networks across the region that um, um, are looking at um, advances in, in technology, um, uh, looking at things like NICE guidance um, and improving clinical care um, across the region. So we work particularly with them to look at the knee challenges as, as I described before. Um, I, I, and in particular, we're really interested in co-creation opportunities with industry and academia. Um, so we support um, the Health Network is also there to support um, adoption of solutions, and we do that 
um, largely through um, something called Art of the Possible, which I'll, I'll come on to a, a little bit later on. Um, and, um, it, you know, the main aim is to drive um, patient care. Um, we showcase the, the latest technology um, in front of, of clinical teams, but we're also now looking at some of those hard to understand areas of the NHS around procurement, you know, who buys things and why do they buy things and how do they buy things, who pays for stuff in terms of the tariff systems and the payment systems. That's really opaque if you don't, if you don't understand the NHS. Um, I should have put it first is what actually is the NHS in the first place because a lot of people have a misconception of of the NHS and so we want to kind of dispel some of that um, uh, within what Health Network North will be doing. Uh, we've had to put quite a bit on hold with the COVID um, but we'll probably start those programmes back up in the autumn. Um, so the art of the possible was this, this issue that the NHS will do try and do what the NHS does um, in its own in its own world, and it generally doesn't look as as often as it should do out to industry. It, it facilitate or, or, or develop its strategy. So um, Sean and, um, and Matt helped me with a showcase that we did at Proto um, in, in March last year. We got sixty to eighty um, frontline clinicians in a room to look at. What was virtual reality, augmented reality, immersive tech, um, and in particular, how would it meet some clinical challenges that that they they are, are are seeing? Out of that came a number of themes um, that we've been working on over, over the last year. Um, in particular, with with Matt and Radical Panda, which Matt will talk through some of that work um, just straight after my presentation. Um, but these are the areas we are starting to look at um, in terms of um, clinical needs um, and clinical themes um, for um, XR. Um, education training is a theme that runs through all of all of that, and we want to engage with um, the SME community, in particular in the northeast, around how they can get involved um, with this work. Next slide, Graham. Um, and, and that moves on to the fees. We are looking at, um, ignore the word hub because we don't really know what this is going to look like and I don't want to confuse it with the stuff that Rachel's talked to you about before. Um, but we are looking particularly with those those themes around how the NHS would like to, to review and adopt um, XR to improve patient care and enhance the way that they, they manage patients, um, especially in surgery. Um, but certainly look at improving um, uh, learning experiences, both for the patient and for um, uh, the clinicians. Um, we've been working with the Northeast um, Local Enterprise Partnership to, to assess how we can do that as a lever for economic growth, certainly within the health and life science sector. Um, whether it's a physical building or a virtual building, we haven't got that far yet. So we are really literally just starting on that journey. So it's more just let you know that we're doing that. Um, Matt will talk you now through um, some of the work we've been doing, um, which has been really critical to, to understand and not actually go with the solution. A lot of the NHS goes with the solution and tries to find the problem. Actually, we've reversed that with the work we're doing with Matt. That's me, Thank you, Russ. I think uh, I've just shared my slides. Is that okay, Graham? Absolutely, yeah, go for it. So, so, so thanks for the, the intro, Russ. So I'm Matt Atkinson, I'm the CEO at Radical Panda. Uh, and as Russ mentioned, we, we began the engagement with the HSN uh, with Sean's help as well at Proto uh, last March. So we, we created a roadmap of lots of different projects and ways which we could help. Uh, and a large percentage of that was using extended reality or immersive technologies. So um, whilst we're a digital transformation company so uh, just to explain that we help uh, business and industry to adopt uh, digital technologies and invest in the right things at the right time uh, we also like to talk about experience innovation um, so to explain that that's everything is an experience you know putting the kettle on before this call was an experience uh, so how do we use technology to, to make that experience better so a large part of what we do is, is design thinking uh, and, and really looking at the process or that experience. Uh, and and uh, there's some key themes like self-service, 
um, you know, get away from manual intervention, just going to a, a company kind of outsourcing and getting the customer to do that. So self-service is a big theme. Automation, and then beyond automation, there's prevention as well. So, so stopping the problem of challenge before it even occurs. So we're constantly looking for opportunities to do that. Uh, and we've got a few examples. Well, we've got lots of examples, but I've got three because of three uh, key themes that I want to talk to, uh, talk through, sorry. So the first one is virtual reality. So how do we press um, the user into an experience uh, and, and that's excellent for training and, and getting them to, to experience something before they physically access it. Uh, we've got a, an example, an MRI, which I'll take you through. Uh, we've got augmented reality, so that's the overlay. Um, so it's how do we assist the process um, and make it smarter using augmented reality. And then we've got a reality experience as well, which is bringing together the real world and some of the technologies, the, the XR space, and putting them two things together to create a brand new experience. So I'll show you that as well. Um, so let's get on to my next slide. So, so first of all, I've just dumped a load of pictures here, but just starting from the left-hand side, um, the, the real problem statement here was, was twofold, and Russ talked about real-world validation. Um, so the first problem was that children and adults would, would turn up uh, on the MRI scan and have a horrific experience because they weren't expecting it to be that loud or claustrophobic or, or that restrictive or that feeling of being alone. So there was lots of different problems. So we really had to look on that and, and understand the, the effect on the patient. Um, so, so whilst there's lots of toys and things, for, you know, working with the RVI especially, um, you've got Lego sets and other things, and, and kids are all smiling about that. Uh, the minion in the background tells the story. He knows uh, it's going to go wrong. So, um, you know, what we inevitably get is as soon as they step into the real environment, uh, there's, a, there's a bit of mad panic and a bit of upset, and then the the, uh, the whole event gets cancelled. And to quantify that, that costs the NHS somewhere between 10 and 20,000 pounds each time. So we're talking about million pounds, uh, you know, millions of pounds worth of waste across the NHS in the UK here. So it was important to, to understand that and say, OK, how can we recover that cost? Now, when whenever we're looking at the process, there's, there's an input, so there's an appointment letter stop this process and then the outcome that we're looking for obviously is is a successful scan and, and treating the patient appropriately so, so so we looked at that and what we always try to do we call the shift left we try to push things uh, towards the left -hand side of that process as possible to, to self-service um, and not using clinical resources so getting things to happen in the patient space at home reduces the impact on the NHS and reduces the cost. So we asked ourselves, how can we deliver an MRI experience to that patient in their own house? Uh, and the obvious thing was virtual reality. So what we actually did was to, to learn the whole process. We went in and videoed the environment, the real environments in 3D. Uh, we even recreated the appointment letter uh, and put some QR codes and things, things in there to, to be able to download an application. Uh, and we built an app, so the app is, is an app, because obviously not everybody has a VR headset. So we built a mobile phone-based virtual experience. Um, Trigger the appointment letter, so the, the basically open the package. There's a, there's a cardboard headset in there. They scan the QR code, they download the app. Uh, they go through a 2D experience first, which helps them to, to prepare for the appointment and understand all of the different aspects. And they can walk through reception and through the different rooms and things and see what it'll look like on the day. And then when they're ready, they can lie down, pop the phone into a VR headset. And there's a bit of a game of gamification in this where they go through a number of different stages to practice the appointment. So they can, they can experience what it looks like. They can hear the sounds, um, you know, they can hear the clinician talking over the top. They can play a bit of music at the same time if they want to. Uh, and if the we're using the accelerometer in the device to detect movement and give feedback as well. Um, so, so that's how we've managed to revolutionise that experience and, and actually capture patient feedback before they come to the hospital uh, to understand what we can do to help that uh, experience be more of a success. So, so that's an example of, of virtual reality. Uh, the next one's augmented reality, and, and that's me and the RVI uh, playing with uh, an ultrasound machine and some needles. 
um, understanding the, the needling technique. So, so two key things with surgery here were positioning. So how do we get the patient into the right position? And that does extend to x-ray and, and some other things that we've done as well. Uh, and then how do we, how do we uh, guide the needle in the right way to, to minimize damage and, and uh, maximize the opportunity to, to get the patient through the, through the surgery as quickly as possible, get them uh, recovered faster and get them out of the hospital faster. So, so this is one of the big problem areas that we picked up that, that actually keeps people in hospital longer uh, when needling goes wrong. Uh, I spent a lot of time in um, in the uh, in the college as well with students, just understanding the training process. And there was a number of different techniques that we we had to study, but just getting the grips of the existing technology as well. So, so we're actually at a point now where we're we're, we're working with uh, Health Education England over in Manchester and and the Canada Northern the, uh, Centre for Cancer Care and the RVI and lots of other. Um, clinical resources to, to really understand the application of this and how we can use augmented reality to, to almost give an overlay uh, and guide the needle. Uh, it doesn't just stop there, but there's certain things that I can't talk about yet. Um, but, but what we're essentially doing is rather than relying upon just ultrasound, it, it's kind of casting an image of the pop um, to be able to guide people uh, and, and advise people on what the different steps are and what they need to do next. Um, one of the problems uh, that we didn't expect that we found from the students was that millennials is they love staring at a screen. So, so when they're looking at the, the ultrasound machine, the screen's up above uh, and they couldn't take that off that, so they're not looking at the needle at the same time. So there's lots of problems with that and that's the sort of thing that we could only find from, from actually getting into the classroom with them and going through uh, the training ourselves. So that was really interesting. Um, that's what I want to talk about, which is the one that this is my personal favourite, the one I'm enjoying the most, uh, is simulation. Um, so we've been into some of the skin centres in hospitals, and, and what you'd normally find is, is something like this, this trusty Annie, they call it, a little torso. Uh, it's totally unrealistic. Um, they can obviously do things like the example you can see on the screen there, but, but there's no patient feedback, you know, there's no moving organs and, and that kind of thing. So it's all very plastic and static and not a realistic experience. So especially when we spoke to uh, paramedics, they have a big problem with, with training people up for many months, and then the step out the back of an ambulance at a road traffic accident, uh, and next thing you know, we've got post-traumatic stress and lots of other things going on, uh, and we've wasted all that training time because effectively they can't continue in the job. So, so we're not talking about how can we make these experiences ultra realistic. And this is where mixed reality comes in. So we're taking the real world of, of being in the back of an ambulance or being on the street in an RTA um, with uh, digital devices like, um, you know, pushing out false smoke, flashing lights, even artificial smells. Uh, so how can we push all of that into the environment to make it more realistic? Uh, and then I've put the morph suit in, the, the, the guy in the white morph suit is an actor. So this is a real person in a white suit uh, that's almost a projector screen, if you like. And through uh, ultimate reality, we can cast images over the top and we can give them a missing limb, uh, a head injury, a sucking chest wound, whatever we want. And we can dynamically change that depending on, on what, the, um, what the paramedic does. So if they make a mistake, we can change the experience. Uh, and, and obviously the actor can give physical feedback by jumping up and swearing or whatever they want to do to, to make it more realistic. Um, so that's a really exciting space that we're, we're looking at at the moment as well uh, in the mixed reality space. I think that's me, Graham. Okay, great. Um, th thanks for that, Matt. I mean, I've jotted a question down. I wouldn't mind asking you later on about that, but um, I guess just to quickly summarise from my point of view on that one, what I'm enjoying hearing about is... Um, I think a lot of people fall in the trap of thinking um, that this is all about developing the, um, the the immersive content, and it's not. It, it, the way you've described it there, 75% of your time is probably focused on understanding the problem and understanding how to work through that problem rather than just the building the content. Um, so I'm really interested to hear from my point of view. So thanks for sharing. Um, you may need to come out of that moment. Yeah, sure, of course. Next screen. There you go. 
Edge, give me a second. Um, okay, I'll move on to Sean, if that's all right, Sean, I just need to, uh, I'll bring the screen up in a second because it's, it's gone off, but if you can just start, so we've got Sean. Um, no problem. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm Sean Allen, uh, CEO of Vector76. We're a 12-year-old VR company, believe it or not. Um, so we work with uh, various sectors, but these days quite quite a bit with uh, the health and medical sector as well. Um, as Matt said, worked previously with, with Matt and Ruth in the event last year. Um, and at the moment, we're working with... Uh, three or four different uh, health-based, medical-based uh, projects. So I'll go through those individually. Uh, yeah, so first off, um, I'm currently working with and part of an organization called XR Therapeutics. Um, XR Therapeutics are a spin-out from uh, Newcastle Uni based on uh, some really great solid work, uh, research work done by Professor Jeremy Parr and uh, Morag Maskey. Um, the work they did, which started in 2012, was in and around using um, what we'll refer to as cave systems, like immersive kind of domes as opposed to headsets. Uh, and they were using these, uh, using these environments to treat all young adults, young kids with various uh, levels of autism. Um, basically, it took the form of various uh, scenes and scenarios such as uh, being in a, uh, you know, having to get on a, a public transport, maybe he's having to cross a bridge, being in a, a public space that's a little bit too busy for you, uh, or dealing with uh, pets and different animals. So, photophobias, which were obviously heightened due to the condition that these folks have. Um, so, their works, as I say, started in 2012. Uh, it was quite successful, very well received academically around the world. Uh, and myself and um, uh, Billy from uh, Software City, and uh, well, Software City generally over in Sunderland, um, we got involved with XR Th Therapeutic last year basically to take uh, the great work that they've done, take it forward, and take it to an entirely different level of a uh, software as a service uh, platform, if you like. Uh, so currently, uh, we're midway through that. Um, we're talking to various universities and hospitals across in the States and over in India. Um, and yeah, uh, that's XR Therapeutics or as much as I can say on it at the moment. Um, other work, uh, we're working with um, primarily Sunderland University and one or two others. Uh, again, similar work to what, what Matt and the guys are doing. Um, in that we're uh, using augmented reality to um, replace the real world equipment that students due to COVID just can't get their hands on at the minute. Ordinarily, they'd book them out of the, uh, of the faculty or the school. Um, that just can't happen. So what we're doing is we're replicating all the equipment that they would use in their paramedic training. Um, they can either uh, augment that from their PC or augment it from a, a little mini app on their phone. Um, so that's uh, you know, a very quick and direct use of uh, augmented reality. Um, in addition to that, we're also working with uh, a company called XR Medical. Uh, XR Medical were born out of a uh, company set up well over 10 years ago, a real, real um, um, kind of, a, you know, first players or one of the first global players in this space. So XR uh, Medical is based around the work of UK Haptics. Uh, who used to be based in the, the Northeast. Um, so I work with the CEO there, Gary Todd, on their next level of, of uh, haptics that they're developing. So with that, again, similar to what Matt was talking about, we're talking about uh, simulating how to, uh, you know, how to use uh, needles correctly uh, and all that sort of medical stuff. Um, but combining the haptic experience, being able to actually feel needles going in being able to feel the cutting of flesh with a scalpel um, and then marry that up with uh, either VR uh, or MR, depending on what the situation is. Um, so, yeah, that's that's really exciting work. Um, we're, we're working with the uh, University of Dundee on a project to do with that as well. Um, 
I, again, I'm limited to, to what I can say about it to the level. Um, but we're, we're looking at making these needles uh, or this whole haptic experience uh, somewhat more intelligent using machine learning to help guide um, that, that, that the problematic uh, issue of getting the needle in the right place. Um, we're looking at systems to, to help the user turn uh, repeatedly to get that completely uh, completely right. Um, other areas, um, I work with a company called iMersive, who are based over in Sunderland. Um, what I'm, I'm all about is inclusive virtual tourism. So using VR to be able to travel to just about anywhere in the world to uh, to experience an immersive experience to do with, you know, whereas the, the Taj Mahal or uh, the Bridge, it doesn't really matter. But you can visit these locations um, and share the experience with, with a group of friends. So you're, you're not just singularly going there um, and kind of looking around like you would on Google Earth. What you're doing is you're sharing this experience with with a group of friends or family, and maybe it's a reliving experience and experiences having gone there in the real world. Um, socially, this is really important, especially you know, given the, the you know the, the relative current lockdown and the possibility that this could happen again. Um, it gets people you know out of the four walls that they're pretty much restricted to, whether that be COVID or whether that be maybe you know some you know some form of uh, inability to get out and about um so yeah it, it, it affects well-being hugely and uh yeah, we're really yeah we're really proud to be working with uh, immersive on this on this project um other areas which kind of touch on health um we work on a lot of training modules with uh, the oil and gas sector particularly health and safety as you might imagine which is a big deal um, oil and gas sector, which strains at the minute, is actually in a bit of a downturn with oil not being worth much. Um, so they're looking to, um, you know, they're looking to optimise their, their training uh, facilities over and above real world training. Uh, so we have the ability to bring like, uh, you know, maybe it's twelve to twenty uh, delegates into or trainees into a given space, train them in real time. They can talk uh, via voice over IP. And uh, go through the various uh, the various modules and learning objectives that they would uh, if it was a real world rig or, or wherever. So yeah, that's the type of work we've been doing and are continuing to do. It's great, thank you very much, Sean. Really appreciate you taking us through that. Um, I think again, just sort of picking up on this, it, it's it's just great to hear what's going on in the region, all the different projects that are happening. Um, but my take away from this and hopefully um, the guys in the audience that the takeaway is that it, it's this is about um you guys needing the problem you, you you need to understand what the challenges are be it within um the nhs be it within the oil and gas sector whoever it may be if you know what the challenges are you can start to dissect those challenges and you can start to um form a solution for that so really interesting to hear so thanks thanks for that um, okay, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now so I can have a look at Q and A's. Um, just a second. Okay. okay so um, I can just have a look to the top. Great. Just while you're looking, at hmm? just uh, just on the point of of really understanding the process. What well, one of the big learnings that that we had. Uh, working with Russ was the different type of memory that's used in, in traditional learning. Uh, you know, people reading a, a book and then having to memorize things. So that difference between um, implicit and explicit memory and, and how okay. it so, so a good example of that. I mean, muscle memory, you know, you, when you learn to ride a bike, you, you, you don't remember the look on your dad's face and the color of the bike, but you never forget how to steer it and pedal. <laughs> the immersive technology especially is that you're, you're in there and, and through haptics like sean mentioned you're physically touching and interacting with things so the mm -hmm. knowledge retention um is really powerful and the ability to learn quicker as well so i learned knee surgery in 15 minutes and then spoke to the senior surgeon at the rbi and talked him through the full process uh, from memory afterwards uh, and it took two years to train that an example of, of how effective that can be. Okay, great. I'm not sure I'll let you loose with a scalpel on my knee just yet, though, Matt. 
<laughs> well, we'll maybe give that a little bit, a little bit more time. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the haptics thing was really interesting. Couldn't, couldn't, couldn't. I'll take myself back to the the old days of playing Operation, the board game, and and just thinking, you know, you could take that to the next level, couldn't you? Let's face it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so Christine asked a question of Russ um, around how well the sort of the new ideas and the projects have gone down with colleagues. I think um, often we're bringing this new immersive technology into organisations, and 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 you know, it's a how do people react to that? Is it reacting with open arms, or is it very much a case of we're putting the, the block blockers up here? So just your thoughts. On I, Russ. No, I, I think once you you get a commission. And to think about it, um, they, you know, they, they they get it straight away. You know, certainly around the education and training angle, you know, it, it you know this is the future of education and training. Um, it, it, you know, the, there is so much pressure on staff to to learn and train in traditional ways that just don't work anymore. And I think COVID's been really interesting. Uh, you know, all training stopped because of face to face and and all of that. You know. That training could have carried on if we'd had all this stuff virtually, um, and and really that's a game changer in terms of moving this tech um, forward within the NHS. The constraints will be the imagination and funding. Um, that, that will be the constraints that we'll have, not that people aren't interested. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I know the um, the training element. Is it, it's not just about fun, is it? Let's let's be honest. It's a serious message to to to, to train these guys and, and and to make sure they are learning. Um, but I guess that fun point comes into it. You know, we've all sat in the training room, we've listened to the seminars, we maybe been involved in a slightly interactive. This just takes it to a whole new level, doesn't it? And and you know, again, from the examples I've seen, people are walking out of these sessions going, "Wow, brilliant." Um, you know, as Matt said, I've I've learned something in 15 minutes there that you know you could have talked to me for about an hour and a half about, and I wouldn't have picked anything up. So it's it's that interactivity. I think the other bit is it, well, you people mean, are trained on how to do it perfectly, trained on what happens mm -hmm. goes wrong, um, and actually that's a completely okay. different dimension as well, Graham. If I'm honest, it's it's what happens when this goes wrong. They don't explain mm -hmm. it experienced surgeons earn their money um because they know what to do when it's done it's gone wrong because it's gone wrong with them in the past younger surgeons it that they mm -hmm. can't afford them to learn by the mistakes um and and i think you can bring that that whole situational thing and um, the stress of that and as well as you know actually how do they perform under that pressure um it, into a virtual experience um mm -hmm. it completely changes the, the way in which they would learn um you know and the kids these days coming up are they they play games they they get it straight away i think the challenge will be them probably taking their eye off the screen rather than and, and doing concentrating on what they're meant to be doing rather than um some of the other things but it, it you know i could go on for hours but i won't okay no really appreciate it um We've got a question here from Paul Bainbridge, um, just thinking about working in the housing sector. I guess this is to Matt and Sean, and just wondering if you guys currently doing any work on projects within that housing sector at this moment in time. Don't worry if not. But I'm, I'm pretty sure we both are. Uh, lots of experience there, both through um, you know councils and, and uh, them sorts of uh, departments within the councils, but, but directly with housing companies as well. Yeah, lots of stuff. Uh, too much okay well I think, I think with that in mind Paul sorry I'll let, let you go Sean as well I think with that in mind um if we could just sort of hook maybe the two of you guys up with Paul at some point to have a conversation around that see where you can help but is any any particular examples from you Sean uh yeah um again <laughs> I'll keep using the sentence similar to Matt um yeah we uh we've done a fair bit of uh, augmented reality work and, and such like with uh, home group mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years ago um in and around a great exhibition of the north um and we continue to um do some work with uh, construction companies uh <clears throat> particularly on not just uh not just say a marketing model but more um encouraging them to to use uh virtual models to get them to like maybe the level two three of bim uh, building information management mm -hmm. 
uh, and using their virtual model for the entire journey of that building. So from initial conception, investment, um, uh, maybe it's the planning people they've got to deal with, and then using that model more or less a handoff with the FM managers to use as effectively a, a manual in their pocket of that building. I think it's fair to say, just to add to that, that the you know the McKinsey Digital Index construction as a whole, that sector is is last place. Uh, globally. Mm -hmm. it's, so it's last place in Europe, but it's second last place globally. They're, they're reportedly 60 years behind the other sectors that have done digital adoption. So, so what we're finding is that there's a lot of transferable ideas um, that we can bring from other sectors into construction. Um, mm -hmm. 